Hello, everyone. Welcome to JetBrains Connect, topics and talk from across the landscape of technology. Today on JetBrains Connect, Kotlin has gone from island in the Gulf of Finland to one of the top programming languages in record time. What's the story behind why this language broke through while others hit a seal? Paul Everett. Today I'm joined by Svetlana Isakova, team lead for JetBrains Kotlin Advocacy. Welcome, Sveta. Hi, Paul. Hi, everyone. I'm thrilled to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, also joining us today, Bruce Eckel, award winning author of Thinking in C, Thinking in Java, Thinking in Python, Atomic Scala. And now with Sveta, Atomic Kotlin. Welcome, Bruce. Hi. We've been crossing paths for decades now. The decades, my friend Bruce, have rolled by, haven't they? Guests go first on JetBrains Connect. Bruce, you and I first got to know each other around the time of Python programming sprints just after the dot-com bubble burst, something you and I had nothing to do with. Can't blame us for the dot-com bubble. Uh, you, tell us, uh, you, you like to tell a story about your dad as your first employer, and now you're living a wonderful life in Colorado. Give us a little of your personal and programming background. Um, well, my father built custom homes, and he was always very meticulous about it. And I think that influenced my, um, ultimately, I I fought it at first, but I think ultimately I kind of adapted my father's um, I don't know, care, I'd like to think, about the, the kinds of things that he builds. And um, I focus mostly on programming languages. So eventually Kotlin got on my radar and I became interested in it. Uh, Sveta, you're leading the advocacy, Kotlin advocacy team at JetBrains. Tell us about your background and how your path led you to Kotlin. Yep. So I joined JetBrains and the Kotlin team, I would say too many years ago, and uh, it's incredible how fast the time flies. You would probably agree with this. And uh, I was at first a part of the development team, and I was always the person who wanted to go to different conferences, to uh, talk about Kotlin, to present, to motivate different people to try it, to use it, and so forth. So at some point, suddenly, I became a full-time developer advocate. And uh, now I uh, now we also have the whole team because uh, Kotlin is now huge. We have many directions, and also we have more people in advocacy as well. So now I also became the uh, team lead for this uh, Kotlin advocates team. As hinted earlier, the two of you are the authors of Atomic Kotlin, published uh, very recently, January twenty twenty one. Available wherever books are sold. More info below in the description, including a details about a special promotion. Uh, you've both been thinking a lot about Kotlin, speaking about it. Before we get into the core issue, though, let's frame some things. Bruce, what is Kotlin? Maybe what it isn't. And people have slots in their brains where they put programming languages. How should people slot Kotlin? Well, I think a lot of the interest for Kotlin is going to come from Java programmers. I don't, you know, in my own view, it shouldn't be isolated to that, but there's a lot of Java programmers out there. So, And I'd say Kotlin is, I mean, you could almost look at it as, okay, we've had 25 years of Java and the issues that, are, that it's still stuck with. What if we started from scratch and created a language but instead of inventing features, let's look at all the other languages and what they've done well and what features have worked out really well and incorporate those and make something really clean and straightforward, you know, get rid of all the noise. I would say that's kind of an overview of Kotlin. But on top of that, make it work really easily with Java and um, Scala 
sort of tried that, but it's not easy to make Scala work with Java. And it is pretty, I mean, it's virtually seamless to use Kotlin with Java. You know, a, a number of things that you said, they sound like really simple and obvious on the surface. But when you start unpacking why Kotlin, these are the things that really perhaps answer the question. Uh, Svetta, over to you. We love to tell the story. Oh, Kotlin, it's an island off the coast of St. Petersburg. I've actually seen the island. Yay me. Um, but there's that's actually a little bit of a nod to the backstory. Where did Kotlin come from and why was it started? Yeah, so around uh, 2010, I think, uh, folks at JetBrains started to think about creating a new language. And I would say that basically for three reasons. At first, there was an internal demand inside the company for a better Java modern language. It was Java 7 at that time, and it lacks lots of things that we now uh, take for granted. And uh, another constraint that, uh, that was crucial at the time was this easily interoperability with existing Java ecosystem. And that's what we have now, what we see now, that it's really seamless to add Kotlin to an existing Java project. The other point was that uh, there was a lot of expertise inside JetBrains for creating different, for actually writing the compilers for different languages. Because when we create IDEs, it's often the case that uh, the folks need to really implement, re-implement re the compiler. So it was a lot of expertise around how to do this, how to do it well, and so on. And also another aspect is it was like a lot of expertise of how to, uh, wh which features of the languages and uh, uh, what parts are really ID friendly. And this is also an important part of Kotlin now, of Kotlin ecosystem. We don't see Kotlin as just a language. We consider it as a part of this whole experience when you work with a language through the lens of IDE. Like for Kotlin is now mainly um, IntelliJ IDE under Studio, but it's like, it's huge thing. And it's not only about the language, but it's about the whole experience. And by the way, in the book, <laughs> in the company exercises to the book, we we give these exercises to learn basics of uh, IDE. So for the folks who are not familiar with this, it might be really useful to learn basics of it in order to uh, to be familiar and to be good uh, with Kotlin. And I mentioned three reasons, so there should be the third one. And the last one was basically the marketing and brand reason. And uh, at, at the very beginning, people knew Kotlin or learned about Kotlin because it was from, from JetBrains, the creator of IntelliJ or another product. And now for some people, it might also work the other way around. So they might know or learn about JetBrains as the creators of Kotlin. So in this case, we can say uh, a little bit kind of goal achieved. Yeah, uh, thanks, Svetta. That's useful for the framing. I think we're going to be getting back to some of that a little bit later. Before we go into the next segment, quick question. When did you actually, when did Kotlin actually get on your radar? You know, I saw some early version of it. There was another language. Kotlin and some other language were being presented at the same time. C Ceylon. Ceylon, that was it. Ceylon, which I was totally unimpressed with, and I guess nobody else was. And I think the very early version of Kotlin didn't, I, I think there must have been a lot of changes. I only briefly saw it, but this was way back at some conference, and I didn't pay any attention to it. And then since either either I wasn't looking at it right or they changed a bunch of things, because when I started digging into it later, it was uh, much more um, impressive than what I remembered. But again, I, I don't know if I miss, saw something or if it was just such an early version. And it looked a lot like Ceylon to me. And neither of them appealed very much. But now, uh, super impressive. Now that we have the backstory on Kotlin, let's get to the core issue. Uh, programming languages, they pop up. Most of them disappear. Some have some kind of modest success. Some, like Kotlin, really break through. Why? What was it about Kotlin that really met the moment when others didn't? And what's the next level for Kotlin? Uh, Bruce, you'll go first on this. Sometimes it feels like the right shoe fits the right foot, kind of at the right moment. 
you've seen trends come and go. You've written books about all these things. What was the moment? What was the opportunity? And what was it about Kotlin that made it the right fit? Well, I'm guessing here, I mean, there's the big picture of the language and how that they designed it. And I think that's long-term thinking. But I think in the short term, um, people were getting, in particular on Android, they were getting um, tired of being held back to Java 5 or 6 or whatever it was. And I think that was just because of the legal issues over the so-called open source Java. And so Google couldn't use a more advanced version of the language. And however, you could use Kotlin and you could have all these new advanced features. That's kind of my take from the sidelines on that issue. I think that kind of helped rocket it forward. But from my perspective, it's the collection of all the kind of looking at all these other languages and saying, what is the best features? And, and not best in the opinion of language designers, but the in the usage that those things have. You know, what are creating productivity? Like, uh, I think you mentioned data classes earlier. You know, and it's not a huge thing, but when you look at how long Java has dragged its heels doing that, I guess... To be harsh, I could say that, uh, you know, at least in the early years, the Java designers were not mm, respecting the user, their programmers, because they were saying, oh, just, you know, write all this extra stuff. And now they're finally getting on the bandwagon with it. But uh, I, I just feel like um, the Kotlin designers were looking at how do we make life easier for the actual programmers. And a lot of that means taking away lots of noise and busy work, even just semicolons, you know. It's like, it's really difficult when you have started using a non-semicolon language to go back to a semicolon language and go, why are you making me type all these semicolons again? And, it, you know, which sounds like the tiniest thing, but I've had discussions with language designers who say, oh, semicolons, this is no big deal. And I, you know... I want to wring their necks when they do that. And it's just, that's just the beginning. And it just kind of goes on from there. Every single feature that you see, or at least, I, I don't know if there's, I, I don't, yeah, I, I, I have to work hard to think of a feature that I still find uh, annoying in Kotlin. And I can't think of one off the top of my head because they've looked around. I mean, another example is uh, new which was unnecessary in Java, but they just kind of cargo culted it forward in, from C++. C++ needed it because you had stack objects and heap objects. So you had to differentiate between the two. But if you're doing everything on the heap, like you are in Python, uh, you don't need new. And so they took it out. And there's a ton of things where that has taken place. And so... I feel like my needs are being respected by this language or, or being more than respected, being thought of. Uh, Sveta, you and your, your team at JetBrains spent a lot of time thinking about the Kotlin story, the message for everything. What's your take on Bruce's take? Talking about uh, the reasons for uh, it became so popular, I also can only agree with this. Uh, so for me, this being perfect for Android at some point I think it was crucial. So, of course, now we have mm. to battle this misconception that Kotlin is a language for Android only uh, after all of this. But I think we can't overemphasize uh, the importance of Google adoption for, of Google um, approval for this uh, adoption boost. And uh, what uh, fascinates me is that it all uh, kind of started from the trenches. So it started from the developer style. It wasn't mm. pushed from top. It was uh, developers who try, who heard about it, tried it, started to use it, and uh, then asked, it's like, we would like to have this approval. And I do remember times when I was talking with people, and it was like, yes, we, we really like this language. It's like, it really suits our own needs, but some of them were adding, but 
we we need this approval from Google in order to use it and so on and so forth. And I do remember this period very well. And uh, I'm really glad that it all uh, happened, <laughs> that uh, we have uh, this approval. And it, it's really amazing how it started, uh, as I think with many other JetBrains products, it always starts from, from developers. So it's not from management. It's not uh, someone says like, yes, now you need, you all use this language. Nope. It's just uh, something that fixes uh, problem, real problems of real people. And they. And I think it. that that, that vibe about developer oriented in the origin also explained the Google decision because all the Android developers were the real advocates for it, right? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So, Bruce, two follow-ups with you. Um, the the story you're telling a little bit about, oh, Java 5 doesn't have modern XYZ, much less data classes, sounds a little bit to me like TypeScript and Babel targeting the JavaScript uh, in the browsers that the pace of improvement was so slow that they needed to transpile at a more developer-friendly source that would target the rather antique runtime. Any parallel there? Um, well, I don't know. I mean, I mean, I think TypeScript added a lot of things in terms of static typing. I think that's that was kind of a big shift for people. Um, but I, anyway, I'm not that much of an expert on, on uh, TypeScript, so I can't say too much about it. I do know that um, my experience with, because so, right now, after writing the Kotlin book, I'm going back and rewriting things in this book that I had out for a while on Java 8. And so I had to go through this uh, kind of painful experience of going from Kotlin back to Java, and there was a lot of grumbling and griping in the process. Um, I'm okay with it now, but I've also noticed that my time with Kotlin has affected how I'm <laughs> writing my Java code. You can't transpile a book. No. Um, I mean, w you know, we test everything so that when... <laughs> when language changes come along, it's automatically, uh, you know, validated. But, um, yeah. but, but just in terms of the way that I think about programming, I'm much more oriented towards making, um, you know, s uh, static uh, final, I mean, uh, final values than I was before. Because you really think about it a lot, ideally, when you're using Kotlin. What can I make that doesn't change so that it doesn't surprise me later? Yeah, and your point about, um, okay, great, we, we get data classes, and great, we get a more modern, succinct developer experience. But there's also this lawsuit that had something to do with it. I find the whole thing kind of fascinating. I was watching a Brendan Eich interview this weekend, and he kind of brought up the old fight between the MIT and Scheme and Lisp Machine purists versus the Unix, Berkeley, BSD, Horde, kind of East Coast, West Coast, formalism versus LSD. <laughs> and that basically, sometimes worse is better, was his point. And that sometimes just to break out of the pack, being better isn't always good enough. Oh, yeah. I think, I mean, my metric is if you're going to go through such a tremendous change as as changing languages even though kotlin certainly makes it easier but it's still going to have a big effect on your company i don't know i feel like it needs to have 5 to 10 times and you know you have to be able to look at it and go oh yeah this is going to improve our lives uh, as a company by like multiple factors uh, Sveta, do you want to have any closing points on this about worse is better, revolution versus evolution, how Kotlin was able to succeed? I think it's uh, kind of inevitable that sometimes revolution happens. So it's like it's really hard to evolve something infinitely. And uh, at some point, everything reaches the point where it's easier to start from scratch. And I think that the whole programming experience uh, shows us that not only about languages, but also about building up systems and uh, deciding at some point, yeah, we, we just 
stop here and we, I don't know, decide to use this new technology, this new stack and probably write everything from scratch, but it depends. So I would say that it's, yeah, it's just the life that we have. So, the, but, but there are st still questions like how, how long and how well we can evolve something. So it was modern and uh, use, useful. And uh, here Kotlin has also, um, to some extent, pioneered some ideas uh, which other languages uh, might be using now. So for instance, with all these uh, experimental features and preview features, when uh, they are shipped at some point early, is like when the features isn't ready, and uh, we have it in the language, and then we collect feedback, as much feedback as we can, in terms of what works, what doesn't work for their scenarios, for the real life scenarios. And that uh, allows to shape these features later. So when they became stable, when they are in the stable released, they are very much ready and uh, don't have any flaws or problems and so on, because they are already, they've been already battle tested in the community. And I think we all are very happy to see the same approach in Java now. With, mm. with their preview features in um, languages, in, in, in new versions uh, that they are not yet stable, but uh, they are uh, kind of battle testing it in uh, in real life. So I think that it is a thing that probably, I, I, I'm not sure about other languages, whether they already also use this uh, type of evolution, but I think it's it's really great that we have it now. Yeah, and at least as far as I can tell, not all of those experimental features actually make it into the... Yes, yes. That's and a good point. So, some might change. So, for instance, recently in Kotlin, we know that we had inline classes for long. It's like we still have them, but now they're called a bit differently. So, mm -hmm. they might be changes during the process and also lots of changes based on feedback. Yeah, and I guess when you've been uh, writing books for as long as Bruce has, everything's experimental, right? Uh, to some degree, although it is interesting, I had to, t to, to, and first of all, I want to say I have huge respect for Brian Getz and his team for, because I just, you know, I would never imagine trying to insert some of these features into Java, you know, and so the fact that he's done it is amazing. But yeah. um, it did take me a while to discover that, oh, these numbered releases don't actually, like, you know, if you look at Java 9 and Java 10, oh, you can't necessarily look at those features and go, well, we can use those. And and then, then there's the long-term releases. And that's sort of, I, I think that's one of the things that's going to, at some point, push people to Kotlin because the dropping support for, you know, previous long-term release things kind of forces companies to move to the new long-term release. And it's not necessarily that it's going to break your code, but you're going to start getting a bunch of messages and deprecation warnings and things like that. And you, you know, you have to deal with it somehow. And I think at some point people are going to go, you know, are we going to use these new features? And if we are, um, you know, they, all of the features have some kind of compromise in them. And that I think is, you know, it's like, if you're gonna use that feature, if it's gonna become important to you, maybe you should use the uncompromised one that you get in Kotlin. Um, I mean, just things like the uh, override. And so you've got the at override and yeah, there are tools that'll tell you, but there's not a compiler flag that says enforce this. And so, wouldn't it be nicer to use the one with the, you know, direct keyword support to actually, if you're going to bother with it? And and there's just a ton of things like that. And we it's actually kind of have this... Brian on our first episode mm -hmm. of JetBrains Connect. And just a a wonderful guest. His, his way of looking at things was really pragmatic, really human. And he had this kind of phrasing of it that um, as you're building something on top of Java, and if you pick some architecture or API or something that doesn't have a lot on top of it, you're kind of in a risky spot that you're going to get kind of orphaned. And they spend a lot of time thinking about what they put in because they don't want one to 10 releases from now for that to be the little Jenga pile that makes everything fall over. With the core issue framed, let's have an open discussion on some of the points. Bruce. You have kind of a storied 
award-winning career in writing programming language books. You've <laughs> you've spoken on this since Moses was a junior dev. How do you look at languages these days? And thus, how did you first look at Kotlin? I guess the more I learn about them, the more I want them to move forward faster because you you begin to see how much we're being held back by languages that don't provide the need, you know, don't provide for the needs of developers and, and, and companies too, even though they don't always know it. So, um, it's, yeah, it's, it's a lot of the details that have gotten glossed over in previous languages or have been experimental and not fixed. I think that's, well, like when, in, when exceptions were introduced, nobody knew what they were. And generics or templates in C++, nobody really knew what they were. And now there's this kind of base knowledge so, people, so we can build on top of that. And that seems to be kind of essential in the development of languages. Let me summarize what you said, see if I got it right. You're the thinking and everything guy. Uh, when you looked at Kotlin, so it sounds like kind of the developer experience stood out to you first. Is that right? Oh, absolutely. That's what I look at is, okay. is what is this going to be like to use and how many impediments uh, does this throw in your way or, or how, m how many things does it just make easy for you? Sure. So, right, this next question is related to that about I'll kind of kind of call it onboarding. Uh, this one's for both of you. We'll start with Sveta. You're both book authors, speakers, kind of in a way you're educators, to stretch it a little bit. What is Kotlin's impact on people's learning, including learning Java itself? Sveta, you first. Yeah, we've been in touch with many educational institutions and uh, specifically educators and professors who decided to teach Kotlin in their courses, in their universities. And um, yeah, it's uh, often about Android, but not only. There are many people who decided to use Kotlin to teach programming fundamentals, starting from variables, functions, uh, control structures, and uh, uh, then a functional programming, object oriented programming. That's the same task that, we, that Bruce and I had with Atomic Kotlin. And uh, we, like, I want to, to, to uh, hear to voice not only my thoughts because you know, I work for JetBrains. There should be this label. Uh, she works at the Kotlin team at JetBrains, so she should advocate, <laughs> be advocating Kotlin. But also we hear that lots of um, external folks uh, share uh, their experience with us. That's how useful they find uh, f uh, Kotlin for all these basic things. How they, um, how it's often uh, eliminate verbosity. So it's like with, uh, with the clearness syntax, it's we simplify the learning and uh, also like with Java, with this classical example, when you have uh, some newcomers for development and they need, they see their first Hello World app and uh, there is this class and it's like a magic why we have this uh, the whole class idea and Kotlin uh, fixes all this. So, so it, it puts things very much straightforward and this whole idea that we have like not classes and functions. So with Java, people are forced kind of to think in terms of classes and with Kotlin it's different. So you no longer have to, you can decide whether you really need a, an entity for this, uh, a, a class or and objects, or it's just a function that, uh, does, uh, that does your job. And it's it's really changing uh, the uh, how we perceive, how we, how we work, how we do our job as developers, but also how we learn. And uh, Kotlin, from my point of view, again, is a really good fit for it. It's it changing the way people engage with their kind of first contact with it, right? Yeah, and, and also simplify your, it. Your yeah. point about you're looking for comments, that's what we in the business call a call to action. So give us some comments down below if you're an educator, if you're being educated, and if you have a viewpoint on Kotlin as the first step, Bruce, share your thoughts on this. So for me, the noise factor is just huge when trying oh. to teach people. And 
I, you know, I saw so many books and articles where people would say, oh, yeah, there's all this stuff in Java that you don't understand, but don't worry about it. We'll explain it later. And so <laughs> that's a but, smell, right? Oh, yeah. And so in in thinking in Java, I said, OK, I'm not going to if if I, I don't want to introduce Hello World unless they can look at every single piece and understand what it does. And it took many, many, many pages before I could introduce Hello World in such a way that everybody could understand all the parts of the program. And there's all this superfluous stuff that you have to, to introduce. And Java's uh, orientation, which came from Smalltalk, uh, that everything's got to be an object. It's, you know, it, it really distorts your design thinking. And I have been finding, um, I do a lot of work in, in Python, and so it's very easy to just, you know, write functions and things. And what I find is that every once in a while, something just isn't working right, and then I discover, oh, that thing wants to be an object. And then objects work great. But then the rest of the time, functions are all you need. And if I want to introduce Hello World, if I can just go, here's a function, I don't even have to, I mean, initially they had arguments in it and then they said, you know, we don't need to require the arguments. That's dumb. Let's take that out. So it's like you can, you can introduce that in, uh, you know, fairly quickly and get people up and going without confusing them and making them go, wow, this programming thing is so overwhelming because I can't do anything before I understand a class or a static or all that kind of stuff. So do either of you have any comments about learning programming via Kotlin versus something like Java versus something like Python? Yeah, we actually discussed exactly this point with, uh, uh, with folks from education, with the professors. And um, uh, there is uh, this thing that Python is often taught uh, at universities as a, as a starting point for not only for developers, but also for people from other backgrounds uh, who will become not uh, like developers for their career, but uh, they still need some sort of programming skills and uh, Python uh, and Python is a good fit for it. As for Kotlin, uh, when we compare Kotlin and uh, Python, we also had... Uh, spoken with uh, different folks who decided to teach Kotlin for these intro courses. And they all told us that it's fine. <laughs> so it's like, it works. You can uh, use just a small subset of the language. So it's like, obviously you don't uh, want to teach any anything sophisticated, but it's, it's uh, absolutely possible to implement some programs with a small subset and it, it, it really works. And there is, uh, was also an interesting idea that I liked. Someone told me that, yeah, but if we're speaking about developers, about folks who are going to be developers and and uh, discuss whether they pick up Python or another language as a first language, Kotlin might be a better choice, probably not only Kotlin, but any language that is statically typed might be a bit better choice because it also kind of fixes your thinking in a right direction. And thus, the comment section blew up, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, so that, that might, but it's, it is very opinionated. So it's like, of course, yeah, sure. uh, there's, there's pros and cons, but uh, there's interesting idea that you might want to, especially for like for Python folks, you might want to learn afterwards this statically type language yeah, sure. to, 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 to actually to see what it brings. And, Do you uh, buy Bruce's until, point, though, that one of the key issues is my first step into programming and I've got all this noise? And that Kotlin makes a much better step because I can go ahead and start accomplishing some things. Absolutely, yes. Yeah, yeah. Bruce, we, you want to can... follow up on this? Yeah, I, I don't say this very often, but I think Kotlin is the most Pythonic non-Python language that I've encountered, and um, I, I don't know. I go back and forth. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's a lot of benefits to teaching people uh, Python as a first language. It's just got a certain, um, I don't know, it, it, a certain ease to it. But Kotlin is very close, and it's like you could teach Python and use optional static typing. 
But if it's optional, are people going to really use it? I don't know. I kind of go back and forth on that. I, I'd say it depends on, on what you're trying to accomplish. I personally would choose from one of those two as, as a first language um, and just depending on what your situation is and what you're trying to create. You know, if you're just trying to get some people uh, excited about programming, um, maybe Python would, be, would have, uh, you know, less hurdles to doing that. Um, but if you're trying to ultimately create someone who's going to be doing development um, a little more seriously, then I, I might... I might actually lean a little bit towards Kotlin as a first language. I would say teach them both for sure. Um, okay, this next one uh, here at JetBrains Connect, we we do the hard hitting story. So this was going to be for both of you. Um, Sveta first. Kotlin comes from JetBrains, a big Kotlin footprint inside the company. Sveta, your advocacy team's job is to tell this story. Um, what in 2021 do you see as kind of the emphasis? for Kotlin communications-wise? There is a very easy answer for this and uh, also easier answer for us because now uh, the, we, the Kotlin team has an official roadmap which announces all the plans and all the things that uh, the development team is going to work on and uh, also um, like in the nearest future and also sort of uh, the things uh, that uh, is not going to work on because they are not uh, there. And uh, it, uh, in a sense, makes uh, our job easy enough because we know what uh, are the priorities of the development team and we share these uh, priorities. So I, at first, motivate everyone to check this roadmap. I think we'll publish the, uh, the link. I think for us, as for developer advocates, one of the focuses is this whole story of Kotlin for server-side because uh, we have this Kotlin, to we have to battle this Kotlin for Android only thing. And Kotlin is a great fit for writing business logic and uh, server side. And we want to create more samples, to, 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 to talk more about it, to share the details. Another uh, priority is Kotlin Multiplatform Mobile. It's about sharing a logic, mainly business logic, between Android and iOS. That's also another big priority both for the development team because they are actively working it, on it and uh, developing this technology. It's already used by many teams. And uh, this is also the, f the, the major importance for us as developer advocates. And uh, the last thing I want to mention probably is uh, the, like if I have to pick up one cotton feature that uh, we need to spend Mm, lots of time in the nearest year on covering and explaining it, that would be coroutines. So that's uh, another priorities in terms of creating content. So like it's already, Google does, uh, Google Fox already do a very good job in explaining uh, coroutines usage for Android. And uh, we probably will focus more on the server side part of uh, things. Uh, with you, the, uh, the things you talked about, the book Crossing the Chasm talks about the difference between the product and the whole product, all the technical and non-technical things that go around it. And so Kotlin's getting a little bit uh, more mature. Okay, Bruce, um, uh, Python, you knew that I would get back to Python, didn't you? Python has argued that programmer speed is a bigger industry issue than execution speed. Uh, Kotlin frequently gets praised for brevity, which, in fact, you praised throughout uh, this so far. Modern and concise, I think, is an expression that you've used. Is this legit? And if so, is it really impactful? Oh, you mean the speed thing? The developer uh, oh, well, that's always been my focus is, yeah. is developer speed. Um, and I think, well, and there's been a lot of things going on in the Python world that make it faster. Optional static typing uh, is, you, you know, that's, that's one of the reasons for static typing is performance. And um, so, but to me, programmer speed is always the most important thing in my mind as how quickly can I make something and then how fast it runs I feel like is something that uh, I don't want to have to worry about and, and of course with with Python yeah there, you, you might reach that point where you need to start fooling around with optimization a lot sooner than you do with 
uh, Kotlin, but um, for 80% of the, you know, or more of the things that I do, it's never an issue. But when it is an issue, you know, like you're running on Android or you're, you've, you've, you know, you're paying money to AWS or something. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's an architectural decision, really. It's like, how, how important is this to you? And how much does yeah, that Yeah, and I think needs? one of the points you've made is it's so easy to get into kind of the Reddit shouting match about Hello World benchmarks when what you should really be thinking about is your staff and mm -hmm. what they can get done per year. Yes, yes. Um, ultimately, a lot of these things are going to be driven by business decisions. And so things like, should we change from Java to Kotlin? Well, you, you actually have to look at that. If you have a very stable company and you don't, you know, you're not changing anything, well, that's going to cost you money and effort and you better have a good reason to do it. But if you're developing something new and you say, well, there's a lot of Java programmers out there, so we should just use Java. Uh, you might want to you might want to question that decision because, for one thing, a lot of those Java programmers are probably itching to move on to something better and more powerful. And you might be able to hire people more easily if you're using, you know, you're going to be seen as a more forward-looking company. So it really just depends on your situation. And I'd love to be able to say, oh, well, absolutely, you should do this and this and that. But you, you have to look at, you know, what are my needs? And, you know, how, how dominant is this decision going to be? You just touched on something that I think is um, really underappreciated, uh, that if you're going to go to someone and say, okay, it's time to switch away from Java, where are they going to go? Kotlin, though, perhaps one of the answers of why Kotlin doesn't make you say that question. You can stay with Java and gradually adopt Kotlin. Evolution, not revolution, right? Oh yeah, it's huge. And um, like, you no, know, I had a friend who just did a little experiment within his company where he used Kotlin uh, just as kind of a trial thing. And he was able to write one uh, little section of it in Kotlin and see how that worked. And he came away, the biggest thing he came away with was, oh, I don't have to think about the null pointer stuff in Java by doing this. And that alone, he said, would be worth switching for. Yep. So and I want to follow up with what you were talking about, some things that you wanted people to keep an eye on. Let's zoom in on that a little bit more. What is something in the Kotlin ecosystem now or in 2021 that people should know but don't? That might be uh, the thing that Kotlin... Uh, so like we have this first level of misconception that uh, Kotlin is for Android only. So we already, I think, discussed it numerous times uh, here today. Uh, the next level is this Kotlin is JVM only. And it's also not true. And uh, for folks who, uh, like for our community, I think it's not a surprise, but for folks outside the Kotlin community, it might be something that they don't entirely know or aware of that Kotlin has uh, three backends, actually. Kotlin code can be compiled to JVM, Java bytecode, uh, but also it can be compiled to native binaries via LVM and to JavaScript code as well. And that opens up this possibility of the whole multi-platform story, sharing code between different backends, between different, like writing Kotlin code once and compiling it to different backends in order to share them between different platforms, be it Android iOS or probably server, server and front end. So it's like these um, main use cases. And that is something that we are actually working on. Lots of people already try it and use it, but it is the thing that probably for some folks uh, might be something to, new to learn about Kotlin. I have All a right. question about that. I noticed it seems like people are not saying Kotlin native anymore and they're saying Kotlin multi-platform. Is that a change in terminology or is it just are they two separate it's, terms? It's change of focus, I would say. It's not okay. a change of terminology because Kotlin native uh, remains. It's uh, just a backend where you can compile Kotlin code. But whenever we want to make focus that we want to achieve multi-platform, it's like we w what we want is to be able to run the same code uh, or to write Kotlin code on different platforms and uh, with some shared logic, with some 
uh, or just being able to use the same language, uh, we use this Kotlin multi-platform thing. And also there's the, there is this Kotlin multi-platform mobile, which refers specifically to Android and iOS. So yeah, Kotlin native uh, remains, it's there, but it's just one of the possible backends. And we make this focus on this huge multi-platform story. Okay, on to kind of a tough question. Kotlin, Java, or JetBrains, JetBrains, Kotlin. Um, I'm going to ask both of you a question on this, and I apologize. I'm going to frame it in the context of a personal story. In 1999, 2000, I used to give talks at VC conferences called uh, Funding the Perfect Beast about open source business models. And I had a slide on there called uh, Perfect Distance about the distance between an open source project and the company behind it, that it needed to be the perfect distance. Two years later, we violated that. Now I've got some stock certificates I can sell in the uh, JetBrains Connect souvenir shop. Bruce, you're neutral. Do you have any observations, uh, recommendations, whatever, on the JetBrains connection to Kotlin? Uh, yeah, I wouldn't call myself neutral because I've been burned a few times by being involved with um, languages that were not open source. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't want to do it again just because, I mean, like James Warden and I wrote a book on, um, on uh, Flex, uh, Flash ah. programming thing. And the book came out and then the whole deal kind of went down the tubes. Um, and Who was the owner of Flash at the time you wrote the book? That was um, Adobe. Macromedia? Or? That was Adobe, yeah. Adobe, and okay. Adobe, I mean, they didn't pull the plug on it. Basically, Steve Jobs did by saying, sure, oh, course, it can't yes. go on iOS yeah, devices. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But ultimately, and then years and years later, Adobe said, hey, we've open sourced you know, Flash and, and Flex. And it's like, well, no one cares now because if you'd have done it right away. And five people rejoiced. Yeah, yeah, and it was like, and it's like, okay, I, I just, no, I, I don't want to use any language that's not open source. But as far sure. as, yeah, the thing is, um, Kotlin was open sourced from, well, at least f from whenever I was aware of it. I don't know if it, if it was originally that it was way. open source, yeah, yeah, from it was originally start. from day one. Yeah. So it's not like, it's not like where the way Java was, where, I mean, is Java open sourced yet? I I don't even know because it's been so long where they go, oh yeah, it's going to be open sourced and then we got to finish suing Google and then it'll be open sourced or I don't know, all of that stuff. It just, I don't think it's good for the industry to have to deal with those kinds of things. Uh, Svenna, I think you have some follow-up on this. Yeah, in Kotlin we uh, just... Uh usually say that it is developed by JetBrains mainly with the help of the community. And uh, you can notice uh, the list of contributors, like we try to uh, insert this list at the end of each release blog post. It's like a long list of people who helped us to, 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 to make all them better. And there are lots of uh, contributions from the community. But of course, the, the, the core development team is inside JetBrains and uh, uh, it's like where uh, the, 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 the process is going. And um, this, uh, but the, this whole process is very open and we really hard try to make it very, to, to make it open in terms of publishing uh, the doc design documents, uh, key, uh, documents and keep any future ideas, open discussions, like everyone here can join and uh, see all these discussions, read and take part in it. And also like provide your feedback in terms of what's upcoming, what you what you would like to have, and so on and so forth. And also, I think Roman Elzarev uh, made this talk of future of Kotlin, and he made these screenshots of future issues. And it's like you see, if you vote, we actually notice these votes for the features, and it impacts the decisions. So it's like we uh, very much try to listen to what's going on. And also there is a Kotlin Foundation, which uh, contains some representatives from JetBrains, from Google, and from Academia, William Cook from Academia. And uh, it is um, responsible for kind of uh, making sure that JetBrains doesn't do any stupid things uh, because uh, they're, uh, they need to review the, the incompatible list of changes 
and make sure that uh, like whether this change um, can go to the language or uh, to the minor version to the, to the major version so we tried to to have uh, this uh, processed so to say and also together with uh, with uh, google representatives because they need also to to have a look uh, at how language is evolving and i would say that uh, google developers also help enormously in developing some of uh, the features and functionality. I, I also have something to add to that, which is that I like the fact that there's a company putting real money behind this rather than it just being a completely open source, you know, the, the normal Wild West open source project. It gives me confidence. Yeah, and that's kind of the the question I was zeroing in on. Um, has the balance been achieved on that? Uh, let's close out this discussion phase. Uh, Bruce, as the books in the years have passed, um, I'm tempted to ask how languages have changed, but instead, how have readers changed? How have you changed as an author and a storyteller? Uh, mostly I've learned that you can't really make an assumption about who your readers are. Like when I wrote Thinking in Java, I said, this is for professional programmers who want to acquire a new language. And then I had many, many, many people come to me in person and say, oh, your book was the first book that I learned programming from. So I realized, no, you, you can't assume that. And when we wrote the Atomic Kotlin book, we said, no, it's got to work for both beginners and uh, people who've already programmed. And so, I mean, that's one thing. I guess the other thing is uh, maybe rising expectations uh, in the, on the part of readers in, in terms of which, which is which is appropriate. In other words, you know, we can't just throw anything out there and assume that people will figure it out. We really have to help them carefully, help them so that so that nobody gets left behind. That's probably the biggest thing is making sure that nobody gets left behind and nobody feels uh, diminished. We tried not to use the word simple or easy or anything throughout the book because not everything is to everybody and so don't don't make that assumption that's that's kind of generally what i would say okay very good discussion a really fun discussion lots to chew on about why kotlin i think we really got into that and the why some things succeed and others hit a wall let's close out with kind of a from the heart segment uh sveta what's something about kotlin's journey that really sticks out with you I would say uh, it's a bit of kind of scale of impact. It's uh, being of this um, higher level of um, chain or abstraction in this um, changing the world story, because uh, Kotlin is a tool uh, that helps people to create other tools that help other people to improve their day-to-day -day life. And for instance, I can install a new app or I don't know, open a web page. And uh, behind the scenes, there will be Kotlin. And I would never know about it. And it's like, I use it. I enjoy, I enjoy using this, uh, this, this thing that other people, uh, people develop, that other people produce. And I was secretly somehow probably even connected to this by helping them to, oh, to yeah. acquire this new tool and to produce new things. And you start to think about it. It's, it's, it's like this scale is infinite. And it's important, yeah, it, yeah, like you yeah. will never know about it. You will never know about all the stories, about all the cases. And like, okay, you, you learned about some, but it's it's just impossible to learn about everything. And yeah, it's it was fascinates me, empowers me, and uh, yeah, in order to just continue doing all all these things that we're doing. So it's uh, it's a really gratifying feeling, isn't it? Absolutely, yep. Uh, really good. Thanks, Bruce. You've seen a lot, you've written a lot. Uh, what about the Kotlin story would you like your viewers to kind of take away? Mostly that um, this language, I mean, languages always say, oh, well, we're doing this for the developer. But this one really is that, that first and foremost, this is to make your experience better. That is really well said. Thanks, Bruce.
That's it for today's JetBrains Connect. Bruce, always a joy whenever our paths uh, cross and we get to do something together. Uh, thanks for doing the Bruce and Paul's old programmers hour, giving us a view you kind of across the history. These and age trends. comments. I'm 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 starting to to feel the only old. reason I have a job at JetBrain so that there's someone older than everybody else. Um, but you've given us kind of a view across the history and trends and programming, kind of reframing them into Kotlin and answering the question of why it succeeded and helping to explain, I guess, why Kotlin is special. So thanks. Uh, Sveta, thanks for helping me on this deep dive into the inner meaning of Kotlin. Uh, see you on Friday, maybe, for the Avocado Happy Hour. Yeah. See you. And thanks, everyone, for being with us. Thanks for watching this episode of JetBrains Connect, topics and talk from across the landscape of technology. Don't forget to leave some comments about today's show or really any feedback that you have about JetBrains Connect. Let's hear your ideas. Want more? We've got more. Click subscribe down below. See you next time.